know what I love about manufacturing is it's all about problem solving. <laughs> I say it's all about, you know, finding a niche and solving that problem before anybody else gets there. And when it comes to additive, Azoth and your team, you guys have done it. One of the cool things about binder jetting is when we got in the game is it existed in universities. You could go to a machine OEM and order some BART, but from like a contract manufacturing standpoint, high volume manufacturing, nobody was doing it. So when we got into the game, I looked at our team, five of us, young guys, single at the time, and we said, look, this is our family. We're going to go to work and we're going to be the best in the world at binder jet. We put our nose to the grindstone. We evolved from making tooling, jigs, fixtures, and to making end-use automotive parts. And then we started to do that at scale. And then to justify to our team that we needed another printer, we ran this thing seven months, lights out, seven days a week. Here. And ultimately, we made the case for that second machine. And our team now has evolved over 16 people. So this thing really delivered on its promise to producing parts day in, day out, and signing 10-year contracts. We're at Azov in Ann Arbor, Michigan, baby. Boom. Mass production with additive manufacturing right here. So with binder jetting, there's really, you know, three core processes. You have your powder handling, your printing, which creates a green part. Green parts about 20% oversized in every direction. Then it goes to sintering down there. So we'll check out those steps. But let's start with the printing down. Now we're looking at the binder jetting. This is the first time I've actually ever seen it. Can you explain a little bit about what binder jetting is and the differences between it? Like, I'm not an expert, but you have one part or you can have like 50 parts if you can actually fit yeah. it and then you can have maybe 60 to 80,000 nozzles and they all just spray right across. That's right. The time would be the same with one part or with as many parts as you can actually fit on there, right? Yeah, you nailed it. I mean, the, a good way to think of it is that you have a shoe box. As long as all the parts in that shoe box are the same material, put in it whatever you want. If you want some okay. medical parts in a corner, defense in the top, automotive in the bottom, if you want serialized components or customized, the printer doesn't care. You can print the same part a couple thousand times over, and then your print speed is set by like how far you go in the Z height. Awesome. The evolution of, you know, Azoth and, and how you guys actually looked at different parts and like the fingers of like robots and different things. Yeah. And when you started looking at like, hey, there's five fingers and, and they want them right now and, and how long that takes. That was a very costly endeavor, right? Yeah. But you step into binder jetting and all of a sudden, like you said, that the light bulb went off in my head because you're like, we can just take these parts and these parts and these parts and these parts and just make it, put them all in one box, print everything and deliver it to everybody that's to right. actually make money that's doing right. this. Yeah, that's what's really cool. It's like if you have a dozen different customers and they all have a dozen part numbers set up with you, yeah. they might not consume those at equal rates. But what we can do, is, since we can nest them all together, if one customer orders five a day, the other orders a hundred, we put those all in one build and print them on demand. So you can awesome. essentially build out like a digital inventory and then print them as needed rather than switching fixturing out every time you would have to machine them. So you guys have a saying, one part, like what, what is we the saying? We call it Tomo, take one, tomo. make one. Yeah. This guy, this guy has all of it, like I love it. <laughs> yeah, so we call it digital inventory and our model there is take one, make one, Tomo. You take one out of inventory, we make one to replace it, and we do that through 3D printing. Because all of our customers, when they work with us, we set their parts up basically in the cloud, but we have a digital twin of the part they need. And when they need it, we're basically in the computer just nesting it together with all of our other customers that need those parts. And then it's really cost effective. So you're producing, you know, in singular numbers, you know, where you have individual parts and you're doing it efficiently because you're printing with other parts, but you're actually combining parts and redesigning them in an amazing way also. Yeah, that's really the holy grail of additive is like part consolidation. So instead of machining three parts with internal channels, three different parts are only three different parts because you can't get the tools into that path. Yeah. With binder jetting, when we lay a layer of powder and then we lay the binder, anywhere we didn't put the binder remains loose powder. So we actually can blow out those internal channels 
in a way that you wouldn't be able to do with traditional manufacturing. And that's where the real cost benefits start to come into play is making stuff that couldn't be traditionally cast, injection molded, or machined. Awesome, man. Bold. <laughs> This is the PX100, and this is the most rigid, the most robust, the best finder jet printer in the world. This would be the highest level finder jetting on the planet. The best. The best. No need to sun quality. The printhead on this machine has 70,400 nozzles. Each one of those nozzles deposits 2.1 picoliters of binder. A pico is 10 to the negative 12. It's doing that at a rate of 15.5 kilohertz. So that's 15,500 drops per second per nozzle on 70,400 nozzles. The scale of that's incredible. It has precision air bearings, linear motors, a granite base as its foundation. It is built like a traditional manufacturing piece of equipment, ready for production. So the very first machines were very slow. We always focused on high quality parts because we start with quality and then we can speed up. So when we look at the older machines, they are significantly slower, but always produce the great quality. And when we go to the next platform, we maintain uh, good quality or even greater quality, but combined with a higher speed, which is very important for, for this process, I would say, to get, get the components. So the core of the machine is built to be industrial, to be able to run in big facilities where you need absolute reliability. So I would say all components in the machine are industrial components. So many people, they know they have great products, but they're not willing to say it. You know what I mean? If you stay behind this 100%, you okay. gotta have that trust in the machine. If you yeah. can't trust your machine, be running when you're walking in every day for these critical parts, you don't have a real business. Okay. I love the confidence. He's like the best. That's, That's it. That's it. Done. We're in it together. Sold. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Love it. So in here is uh, heavily our inspection area for Azoth. Um, this is a blue light scanner for reverse engineering for first article approvals. The way this works is basically you can scan or take a picture of that specific angle of the part. The rotary table will spin the components so you can get pictures from every angle and you can actually pull these back into the computer and create a CAD file to print your parts in the future. Really useful tool for running off new components. This is a run after centering. Parts were unloaded based on where they were in the furnace. We bring them in here on these carts and then we do inline inspection. So just depending on the component and the product family you're making, a lot of them will go through hard gauging. So uh, calipers, micrometers, height gauges. Some of them will go through optical inspection like on a Keons, for example. And then some of them, if you need more, more dimensions, you'll go through a CMM and do a full layout on them. So these are guitar nuts that we actually 3D print. So we 3D print the guitar nut out of a stainless steel, which then gets hardened. All the threads are printed right into the component. So this is a really nice piece that traditionally you might cast and then post machine. And here we can 3D print, heat treat, and it's done. So this is a mag release uh, for a firearm. So you can see here, you know, again, this part would traditionally be either metal injection molded or machined. In this case, we're replacing both with binder jetting. The reason you would switch with binder jetting is because it's much more cost effective than machining at scale. We can print thousands per build and it's not quite as cost effective as metal injection molding, but you can manage a lot more part numbers without manufacturing cost really expensive molds for MEM. So here there's no tools. We can make a lot of different components. So this is destructive testing, a tensile frame, we can actually mount these components and do destructive testing on. This is a flagship part for the binder jetting and metal additive industry. This is the first safety critical metal printed component in a vehicle with General Motors. So this actually goes over your shoulder. It's where your seatbelt rides. This consolidated four parts into one assembly. And at Azoth, we'll print these components. We polish them, we get them chrome plated. And after every center run, we'll actually do destructive testing and pull these till failure to make sure that they have all the right specs. This is actually a dental tool. This is uh, used by a dentist to allow this needle to go underneath a, a patient's gum line to inspect the root of the tooth. So a cup right there pulls in a little endoscope so a camera can do down the middle of the needle. That small little needle there actually light and water can pass through it. So it's a non-invasive way to see if uh, a patient's root is intact. That, what's awesome is like the inspection must be crazy on these. So how do you ensure 
that like deep inside here, like, like there's nothing clogged up or, you know, like how do you actually inspect inside the holes? Yeah, sure. We have some specialty gauge pens that we have made that fit the exact diameter that is on the engineering drawing. And we use these gauge pens to sample 100% of the parts to make sure they're completely free of loose powder or burrs or anything else. Through these gauging operations, we ensure that the part meets the customer's requirements. So with binder jetting, you're creating what we call a green part. It's metal powder held together with binder. And so every green part's about 20% oversized in each direction. And what you do is you stage it into the furnace for an operation called centering. Centering is about a 20 hour cycle. The first part of the cycle, you're removing the binder. And then the second part, you're ramping up to near melting temperature of the alloy, usually about 10% below melting temperature and you hold for a few hours. And what happens is the parts will actually shrink about 20% in every direction. Let's check out what it looks like to load up one of these furnaces. Inside, this is all a material called molybdium. It's an all metal retort. And there you go. So this is what it would look like after you have staged your furnace and ran a centering cycle. Out comes a fully dense metal bar. You can do to it what you do to any other metal part, but a lot of binder jet parts, they ship as is coming right out of this furnace. You can pull that out and you can see just how many parts you can potentially get. So when it comes to the binder jetting, how, how much material do you lose? Like how much shrinkage do you get? You get about 20% in every direction. And you guys are pretty much, you calculate it perfectly. Yeah. So when you guys build it up and then you print it, then basically you know exactly where to put it to get it down. Yeah. And what type of tolerances can you hit? Yeah, so typically we say uh, plus or minus three thou would be about okay. the tightest you're gonna hold right. on small feature. Five thou would be typical but it does depend on your part size. So usually I give people a 1% rule. Whatever your drawing nominal value is, yeah. multiply it by 1%, that's gonna be about the ballpark of where you're at with binder jet. Okay, so when you look at all the different variations of 3D printing, binder jetting is not only the most efficient and fastest, but it has the best service finishes and like the tolerancing. Yeah, tolerance class is awesome with binder jet. Awesome. And what I typically tell people, it's it's a small complex metal part technology. So really I'm focused on parts 120 millimeters in the longest direction or smaller. As you start to get larger than that, there's other metal printing technologies that might be your best friend. Nice. Oh man, what's up, Shy? How are you, brother? All good, man, all good, very excited. Hey, thanks for bringing me over here, man. So Azoft is doing big things in the world of additive and using your binder jetting printers, the best in the world, and, and it's cool coming here because you see the evolution of the different printers and how each one got more efficient and better to the latest version right here which is incredibly fast accurate and is the best binder jetting printer on the market in the world period from mark forge oh you must be like a proud dad right there i am i am especially when you see this as a real factory floor yeah printing thousands and thousands of parts going out of here for real automotive application defense application, medical application. This is the real deal happening yeah. in real time. Super efficient, done, production. Go on to the next one. Mass production with additive manufacturing right here. Boom. Boom, guys. So what's the future look like? It's a ramp up. So more advanced manufacturing execution systems, more advanced inspection and automation. I think that's a key for Azos. And, and when you look at other countries, nobody's gonna outdo you guys. You guys have figured out the efficiency and the technology in a way that you can, you can be in Germany or you can be here, you're not gonna save time, right? Because you guys are on the cutting edge. When we're going to our customers, it's really, hey, launch your innovative design with us on a digital footprint so that we can keep manufacturing here in the US and keep manufacturing exciting. I mean, people like getting into this plant they like seeing our investment in technology to build the factory of the future. And I really think additive has a big role in that. Making complex additive structures, multiple pieces into one, heat exchangers, RF antenna, surgical tools. I mean, we're working on patient specific implants. That's stuff that young people get excited about and wanna come to work in a manufacturing setting. Right here in America, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Let's right go. Michigan. Boom. <laughs> Love it, brother.